Now I'd like to introduce you to our featured speaker. Our speaker is Doreen Wang, who is the Global Head of Brand Z at Cantar Millward Brown. She's a seasoned executive with extensive experience in providing outstanding market research and strategic consulting services for senior executives in Fortune 500 companies both in China and in the U.S. She currently leads the global Brand Z engagement across 43 countries, the launch of Brand Z Global Top 100 Most Valuable Brands, and the annual rankings for China, Brazil, India, and Indonesia. She plays a leading role in consulting to top companies and particular fast-growing companies in China. Companies include Tiffany, L'Oreal, Land Rover, Chanel, Burberry, Alibaba. She's also been uh, a lecturer and speaker at various forums, including the UK House of Commons, Bloomberg News, NASDAQ, London Stock Market, Wall Street Journal, and Cambridge Judge Business School. Doreen translated the book Grow by xp and Global CMO Jim Stengel into Chinese and wrote the chapter of Brand Ideal in China. Doreen has two master's degrees, one in marketing, one in econometrics, and she's fluent in English and Chinese. And with that, I'll turn it over to Doreen. Thank you very much, Gordon, for the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting us to the MSI session. Hello and welcome everyone. Today we are going to share with you some key lessons learned from Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Brands, the vital signs of brand health, and how to keep your brands grow in the future. So first of all, we will give a quick introduction to the Brand Z study and how we create brand valuations, then a summary of the key 2017 Top 100 findings. This then leads us to the lessons for building strong and sustainable brands. On June 6, 2017, we launched the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for the 12th year. So big congratulations to the Most Valuable Brands and the category winners. I did a calculation. So winning the global Top 100 out of 120,000 brands we have researched is statistically more difficult than winning the Academy Awards. So it is you, the brand leaders and agency partners' commitment, dedication, and hard work which has developed the most valuable brands. These brands are valuable because they are valuable in the minds and hearts of their customers. Brand Z is the largest brand building platform worldwide. It is the most robust and objective approach. We have interviewed over 3 million customers by using Kantar Muir Brown's MDS framework to measure how meaningful, different, and salient these brands exist in the consumer's minds, which impact them buy more and pay a higher price. Why do we need to build strong brands? Right, strong brands generate uh, better price margin, send up competitor, but over the past 12 years, we have the key finding, which is very impactful for Wall Street, uh, as well as like London stock market, NASDAQ, is strong brands generate a superior shareholder return. The power of strong brands means that their owners' stock prices hugely outperform the benchmarks. Now the strong brand portfolio has grown 125% over 12 years compared to only 82% for the S&P 500 and three and a half times more than the global MSCI index, Morgan Stanley Capital International Index, which is one of the best performing funds. And strong brands are a very valuable asset and generate a superior shareholders return. And more importantly, if you look at the, the difficult economic downtime, 08 09, both strong brands and average brands actually dropped their share price. But it only took strong brands half a year versus the average brands four and a half years to recover. So marketing and the branding investment are not cost. So let's keep this in mind. Marketing and the branding investment are not cost. It is the most important investment any company should make to ensure long-term and sustainable business growth. So how do we arrive at a dollar value for a brand? 
three simple steps. First, we need to determine from published data the financial value that name that the brand has. Then, from the brand Z data, apply the proportion that is brand-driven, the brand contribution. Multiplying these two together produces the brand value. The combined value of top 100 is in 2017 is up 8%. So even in this time of geopolitical upheavals and uncertainty, brand continue as a heaven of stability. The total value of the top 100 has reached to 3.6 trillion US dollars. That number looks big. Actually, that number is very big. Is bigger than the country GDP of Germany, the fourth largest economy in the world. And the top 100 has grown by 152% since 2006. And 12 years ago, probably you would drive in your Toyota during a bank opening hours to the nearest city bank. You park, you go inside, get some cash from the teller behind the counter. Then you would drive and park in Walmart to do your monthly shop. And there you might well include some Coca-Cola and Marlboro in your basket. None of these brands are still in the top 10, although they are still quite strong brands. But today is very, very different. You might well do everything via one of the ecosystem brands at any time of the day or night. Or maybe look up something of interest to buy on Google, order it with your Apple iPhone, and probably speaking to Siri or ask Alexa on Amazon, and get home delivered a few hours later. And the big are growing bigger. The top 10 have outgrown other brands, and in 2017 are worth as much as the entire top 100. 12 years ago, so 1.4 trillion US dollars. And tech-related brands grew actually 15% compared to the non-tech at only 4%. So all the newcomers were also tech-related and originated in the US, although we see a pattern of these newer Silicon Valley brands that think global from the outside, from the onset, and typically launch simultaneously in up to 50 country markets. Their mindset is very different, and they are significantly younger. On average, they are 20 years old, and versus the, the, the current global top 100 is 70 years old. So the ecosystem brands that capture more of your transactions are harder to leave or change from. And the, uh, the advent of AI as the new battleground within the ecosystems and the noticeable innovations does differentiate four of our top five, like Google, Google Assistant, Apple Siri, Microsoft, Cornata, and Amazon Alexa. And the only non-US brand in the top 10, Tencent from China, is also a very, very powerful ecosystem combining messaging, online gaming, online shopping, and much more. So outside the top 10 Samsung, so Bixby, also um, the recent uh, S8 launch, which illustrate that others are seeing the value and the importance of this developing space too. So now, uh, I have a question for the audience for you. So which of these three brands do you think score on brand Z as the, most, as, the, as the healthiest? Is it Amazon, Facebook, or Ikea? So please, please click on your vote. And I hope to see some of the audience, uh, your selections, so, so based on your perception. So uh, I'd like to give our audience a moment to decide and vote. And Hannah, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot see the audience. Uh, okay, I can see the response now. All right, great. Yeah, we have, let's stop here, and we have uh, very good uh, total responses. And uh, the winner from the audience is Amazon. Amazon got 33 votes, and followed by IKEA, 25 votes, and Facebook, 12 votes. So let's see the answer. We have a great group of audience, and they are all, though all three of the brands are 
very, very good, but Amazon edges it. Yes, you are right. Amazon is particularly driven by brand experience, making people's lives better and able to deliver it. Facebook is very strong on innovation and IKEA on brand purpose. And purpose, innovation, and brand experience are three of the five growth factors we will be examining shortly. And so what does the performance of the most valuable brands tell us about success now and in the future? Uh, so to introduce our special analysis for this seminar. So for this webinar, and we have specially looked at the change in brand value of the same 86 brands that we have in both 2006 and today in 2017 so that any change in value must be related to their performance and not from adding in different brands. So we have then split those brands into high, medium, and low performers on, on key metrics to examine exactly what drove success and the reasons for that success. So let me show you. So being meaningfully different is the way for brands to succeed. First, let me explain the chart. As I said, we have 86 brands that are valued both in uh, 2006 and 2016, so they are the same brands. So we can look at the change in brand value over those 12 years split by whether a brand is a low score or um, meaningful different back in 20, 2006, the left-hand column, medium in the middle, or a high score on the right. It is clear that brands that are rated by the customers high on meaningfully different grew significantly more than brands less well rated. So nearly five times more. So meaningful difference is the key to brand success as a predictor. And there are three high meaningful difference brand examples. YouTube, so one of this year's global top 100 newcomers, in at number 65, and reflecting the growing momentum of technology brands. The most meaningful different brand within online sharing and networking in the US and in UK. And this PayPal, also a brand with growing momentum, rises 13 places this year to number 52 and now worth almost 20 billion US dollars. The brand is very clearly established. The perceived point of difference is only likely to be enhanced by the imminent addition of instant transfers to any bank account. And Tesla, the fastest rising car brand in 2017, uh, value increased by 32%. The excitement around um, the Model 3 continues to build and is clearly driven by the brand's incredibly clear point of difference within the automotive industry. So the evidence is that meaningfully different brands are in fact healthy brands with all the positive vital signals. So how we see a cross plot of the top 100 brands in 2017 of their meaningfully different scores up the side and their vital sign scores across the bottom, they are very much aligned. R square is 0 0.74 for the technically uh, minded. So which is saying that the more meaningfully different a brand is, the healthier or that the healthy brands are more meaningfully different. So the vital signs, the five vital signs of brand health, the key drivers of brand value growth. So here are the five vital signs. Just as there are many contributors to human well-being, there are also multiple factors that contribute towards a healthy brand. Brand Z analysis has identified five key attributes shared by uh, healthy, strong, and available brands that each diagnose just how much a brand is delivering meaningful difference. So the starting point is brand purpose, creating an impression of making people's lives better. Those brands start with an average, however deep, the purpose. And those brands that underline their purpose with innovation, which means that they are seen as leading the way in their sector and shaking things up. And crucially, the perception of innovation must stick to the brand, otherwise it is not an innovation. They must also be creative with powerful, memorable advertising and communications. 
and they, have, they needed to provide a great brand experience that meets consumers' needs and is available when and where consumers need it. So out of this, consumers develop a strong sense of love towards the brand, which then sustain it until the next big innovation starts. So when a brand is strong on all five of these attributes, and they, of course, they have healthy vital signs, and if they are lacking in any one area, they are at risk of damaging their brand health and end their performing in the market. If they fail on all five measures, they are classified as being frail. And some of the best known and the most valuable brands in the world that score highly on all five of these measures include like IKEA, Amazon, IBM, and Facebook. So four in 10 of the top 100 on the left have above average scores on all five of the vital signs and are therefore healthy. So only 7% among our global top, top 100 are frail. And their average vital sign scores is 110 compared to on the right, all the brands uh, in our database, which average 100. So these um, 120,000 brands so have only 8% that are healthy and many more, like 36%, that are frail. So showing the power of the top 100. So let me share with you an interesting example. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with HDFC. It is the most valuable Indian brand from our Brandy Indian ranking, and also our one of our global top 100, which has increased in value by 22% over the past year, so double the, the average of a global top 100. And this coincides with an improvement on its vital science health score uh, to a high level, so from an average like 100 and right now to 109. It is a brand, HDFC is a brand that has worked on its ability to make people's lives better, which is our brand purpose measure. As we see next, this is, has an impact on other uh, brand health uh, aspects. So the five key signs of a healthy brand are purpose, innovation, communication, brand experience and love, HDFC continues to strengthen its digital capabilities and presence outside of India's urban core. And the bank opened its first digital branch in Pune this year, offering 24-7 banking for, for customers for the first time. So the bank has also invested in education partnerships alongside the government and the youth training central uh, providing career counseling. So as you can see that, uh, because of the brand purpose increase that is impacting the other perceptions from innovation all the way to brand love. And here, another question for you. So which of these brands do you think has the highest of brand purpose? And you can vote. Um, is it PayPal, IBM, or Visa? Purpose, when you think of purpose, is making the people's lives better, making the world a great place. So we'd like to give a few more seconds to our audience. So, oh. great, I'm seeing the vote are coming up. Great. And now the answer from our audience is we have 27 votes for PayPal, we have received the 24 votes for IBM, and 17 votes for Visa. Okay, let me show you. The answer is, well, it's, it's, a, it's a little tricky. They are all much the same, and marginally in order, PayPal, then IBM, then Visa. But any answer wins the point here. And PayPal is also very strong on brand experience. IBM mainly on purpose, and Visa generates great love. So PayPal is a brand with a clear purpose from its uh, inception, so facilitating easy, secure money transfer online. And IBM striving to deliver the industry's most advanced information technology, and now with uh, Watson embodies this purpose um, terrifically. And also Visa strives to be a payment network that connects the people 
uh, of the world with innovat innovative and secure uh, payment solutions. And given the increasing advance of the Internet of Things, Visa has built out a global network of partners to offer secure digital payment via um, Internet of Things devices, including appliances and wearables and many more. And the important finding is that healthy brands grow faster. And so we have just seen some good examples, like Visa grew 10% uh, this year, so more than 8% for the top 100, as how IBM grow 18%, PayPal 20%. Strong purpose has a particular effect, as you can see on this chart. It can almost double uh, if you are perceived high on purpose, your growth rate can almost uh, double uh, the brands perceived on, on average or low on brand purpose. And if that purpose is supported by, uh, is supported and enhanced by innovation, as I stress that innovation is not innovation unless it is perceived by the relevant users and the potential users of the brand. So here you see that it is either make or break. So unless the perception is very strong, there is relatively little effect on growth. So for the perception of innovation for, for brand builders, and you have to achieve high on the perception on innovation. Otherwise, that won't have that as much impact on your brand value growth. So the stock price of the most innovative brands as the top in purple outperformed the top 100 by 172%, so far higher than the S&P 500 and the MSCI index. And also, the top innovative brands on average invest 35% more on advertising and are able to achieve seven times brand value growth over time. So it's a great ROI, right? So brand investment is critical to drive customers' perceived innovation and the long-term brand value growth. And Tesla is a very interesting and it's a very innovation-led brand example. So it's based on shaking things up or disrupting. So the premium electric car brand has gone up to number eight in the world's top 10 most valuable car brands and is entering the mainstream car market with its Model 3, 35,000 US dollars. And moreover, Tesla is using the same retailing model as Apple, so selling directly to, to customers rather than uh, go through the dealership. And you can order Tesla's car online, visit the company-owned showroom. It has a reputation that goes before it, so similar to those uh, Apple and Facebook exhibited in their early days. And also, here is another interesting example, is Gucci. Actually, Gucci's perceived innovation declined for quite a few years until very recently. It indexed at 122. It is a good turnaround brand example. And there are two things Gucci has done right. Number one is to create excitement around the brand. So Gucci reinvented its traditional look, introducing very bold colors and patterns. And second, Gucci began to redesign its 525 shops around the world and accelerated the, the supply chain. Its value has outpaced the top 100 significantly over the past three years. So amplifying the purpose and innovation by relevant communications adds more value. So high communications brands grow significantly more over 12 years. Shell is a, is a good example. Shell has risen uh, nine places in global top 100 to number 57 and growing its brand value by 23% to 18.3 billion US dollars and is the fastest growing B2B brand. So in a category, uh, oil and gas, which is under great scrutiny uh, from consumers, it has changed perceptions by emphasizing innovation, aiming to own uh, the conversation about the future of energy. So its, it's successful Make the Future Clean Energy campaign topped uh, 2016's uh, viral video charts for uh, a number of views. So, but uh, the proof of pudding is in the eating. 
as we say. So all the hype and the messaging cannot sustain the brand unless the experience lives up to it. And this is a point at which consumers change or maintain their opinions about a brand, which can make or break its future. And the powerhouse that is uh, Amazon is a remarkable story of growth. So up more than 2,000% in 12 years, now valued at 139 billion US dollars. So one of the fastest risers in the top 100. So only last year alone putting on another 41 billion US dollars. So the result, a charge up the ranking from near the bottom to number four today, and it continues to grow and innovate. And the latest installment being the acquisition of Whole Food Markets to, to challenge the, the grocery sector. And Amazon has developed a true ecosystem brand, so which increasingly uh, improve our lives in new and exciting ways as the brand continues to innovate at pace. And CEO uh, Jeff Benzos talks about the brand's commitment to day one mindset, meaning that every day is treated as a fresh challenge to complacency as the company continues their innovation push. So in addition to the core online retail and the consumer electronics business, the company has developed a range of other services, and all of which contribute to the overall Amazon experience. So some of these include uh, Amazon Prime, Video, Music, originally launched as a free shipping service for members, and Prime now include one-hour delivery slots for some items in certain cities. Also, um, Prime now includes access to Amazon Video and Music services at no uh, additional charge. And also Amazon Echo, which connects to Alexa, Amazon's AI assistant allowing users to perform various tasks, including playing music and of course ordering products directly from Amazon. And to tell you and share you my personal experience, I have five Alexa in my home, so Alexa name is more familiar to the kids than my name now. And so great brand purpose followed by innovation and the relevant communications and a great experience produce brand love. And without love, on the left, the growth is extremely modest. And the brands that earn love are in a much healthier position. And my final question to the audience, so which of these brands do you think enjoy the highest on love among the global consumers? Is it Disney, Nike, YouTube? So which of these have generated the most love? All right, I've seen, uh, I've seen the voting is going up, and I will tell you the answers from our today's audience. Okay, we have almost all the audience, <laughs> uh, not all the audience, like the majority of the audience voted Disney, 43 uh, votes for Disney, 10 votes for Nike, and 10 votes for YouTube. Okay, let's see the answer. Oh, that's, that's the answer for, okay, let's see the answer from the consumers, from the customers. And they are all loved brands, and the YouTube wins it. And, and of course, Disney and Nike are all very, very strong on uh, communication, on delivering brand experience, but YouTube um, is particularly being applauded by the billions of users on brand experience and which is the foundation of love. And we find that love um, is, in the digital era, in the AI era, love is not just warm or nice. Love follows great experience. And of course, being warm or nice is important, 
but being all authentic is way more important than just one more nice. So finally, a healthy brand is a wealthy brand. The, we are seeing that the validation of healthy vital signs is the brand value growth of healthy brands versus, versus the frail brands. So being healthy is a huge, huge value driver. So more than 15 times more effective to drive brand value growth than the average or frail brand. So as brand builders and as um, marketers, and there are three questions we all need to ask ourselves as how can we continue to grow our brand value. So question number one, and we need to think and act in a way that my, uh, your brand can make people's lives better and make the world a better place. And second is to keep innovating. And, and to that purpose, and innovating to, to that purpose. Innovation is not for the sake of innovation, but innovation is a holistic communication and a delivery, and to ensure it is clearly communicated. And by doing so, you will be building meaningfully difference for your brand, and the result will be growth and profitability at a faster rate. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, that's the content uh, we are going to share with you, and we still have uh, quite some time for questions and, uh, and uh, some of the thoughts to exchange. Thank you very much, Doreen. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in, and I'll start with those. With people can uh, feel free to send more questions directly through that chat with presenter function in the left-hand side of the screen. Um, one of the questions is about the top 100. You mentioned some pretty radical changes in the top 10, shifting to a lot of the tech brands. What, what's the uh, degree of switching, or how, how similar are the top 100 from this year versus 2006, which I guess was your benchmark year? How have yeah. they changed or not? Uh, what we shared is um, the top 10 of 2006 versus the top 10 today, and we can see that there is a big shift um, uh, to the technology brands, especially this year. The first, the first time ever we see the, all the top five are technology brands, and we call them fearsome five, uh, Google, Apple, Microsoft, um, Amazon, and Facebook. And um, as I mentioned in the presentation, quite interestingly, four of the, the five brands are ecosystem brands. So they are not just one brand from the traditional category. Right now, they are the platform brand. They are the ecosystem brands. They try to build their brands around uh, all the purchasing uh, funnels or the purchasing route of the consumers. So the, the change uh, over the past 12 years and the moving toward the technology brands we're seeing is mainly because of consumers' behavior change. Consumers' purchase behavior has, has changed significantly around the world. This change is not just happening in the U.S. or, or, or Europe, but also happening even at a faster speed in faster-growing country market. I just came back from Indonesia last week, and on my, I'm on my way to India next week. And we're seeing that Indonesia, India, China, and these countries, and they almost skip uh, one um, the skip like 10 years and move directly to mobile. And that's actually exhibited as these brands, the technology brands opportunities to build their platform around the consumer's lives. So are you seeing those same kind of trends in the, let's say the top 100 that you presented that you mentioned in the top 10? Is, is that, you're saying it's throughout that uh, top 100 as well? Uh, throughout the top 100, um, we're seeing, um, I don't have the number of tech brands, but the, the value of tech brands is 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars, so almost one-third of yeah. um, the total value, uh, 3.6 trillion U.S. dollars. And not, uh, so it's not, we're, 
the the number of brands is about tw twenty. I I will check and get back to you on that. Is but the the contribution of the value is huge. It's one third. Right. And many of them are are growing yeah very fast in the recent years. We have a number of uh, questions, more questions about you know how you come up with these numbers. Uh, one one of the key uh, elements of the brand value is what uh, is the brand contribution. Yeah. How do, you, how do you create that? How do you calculate that? Yeah, uh, that's a good question because um, there are two steps. First step is financial value, and the financial value is uh, being calculated uh, through the corporate earning and the intangible asset, and we, we need to separate the overall earning and to see how much the brand has contributed, uh, how much the brand has, con has created uh, the total uh, corporate earning. And the step two is brand contribution. Brand contribution is from uh, the, the customer survey being validated by Google Behavior and Google Search Data. And we, we, are, we have, I, as I mentioned earlier, and we have interviewed over 3 million customers and the consumers around the world and by category. Um, so we have covered uh, over 50 categories around the world to understand um, how meaningful, different, and salience. So meaningful, different, salience, and the brand power and premium, so, they, so that they, want to, they can buy more and, uh, and pay more premium, as well as potential. So we calculate uh, brand growth potential. So brand contribution is a summary index of um, these individual indexes. And just uh, so I make sure I understand it, what you're saying is a lot of the information is coming from surveys, 3 million of them. And then yeah. on the other hand, the information is coming from actual uh, market Financial data. data. It's, it's yeah. mainly Bloomberg data, yes. From Bloomberg data. So those two sources, yeah. surveys and financial data. Um, another question about the measures. Um, how, how do you measure brand love? That's something that a lot of uh, different researchers have approached, including some of the uh, academics. Can you uh, explain to us how you measure brand love in the survey? Um, when we measure brand love is, is an overall uh, emotional attachment uh, question from the survey. Um, it's, um, it's a 10-point scale, so from zero all the way to 10, and the consumers are comparing uh, within their category, so because Brand Z uh, is conducted by category, so we, we have uh, all the rankings are first done as category leaders and then compare across um, categories and through a weighting and, and, and the calibration. So um, the love question is measured as, as consumers' direct answer, so which of the brands uh, you love more, and so that they put them in the 0 to 10 scale and, uh, and putting the brands at the place. They feel more uh, emotionally attached. Okay. So it's in a comparative, yeah, it's in a com like comparison. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one brand, it's a brand compared to uh, in the competitive landscape. Yep. Um, other questions are coming in here. Uh, you were talking, well, we got that question about brand love. One follow-up to that is people are asking, how does brand love and brand experience, how do those two concepts or the measures of them, how do they differ? Uh, brand experience, uh, what do you mean by how they are, how they well, are different? I think differ? people are probably, some people are probably saying, well, they sound like they might be getting at the same thing. So I'm wondering if you can help uh, us distinguish between how you, what the measure is of brand love versus what the measure is of brand experience. Are they highly related, or are they, are they actually uh, somewhat different constructs? Oh, uh, they are not highly related. They are all different, they are different questions. So like brand experience are 
the consumer's feedback on um, how they experience the brand uh, the, from, through like the service, the service of the brand, and also the online experience of the brand. So we ask the consumers uh, three questions. So uh, the overall experience of the brand, uh, as well as the online mobile uh, experience, uh, as well as um, the customer service. So the actual ways in which the customer interacts with the brand yes. different yes. from the brand love. But love is, love is the overall emotional, overall emotional attachment consumer feel toward the brand. Yep. How, does this, how do these results apply or do they apply to nonprofit brands? I think so. I think these results do apply for uh, uh, nonprofit brands. And however, our ranking, we only include those public traded brands because um, we need to be authoritative on uh, financial valuations. So we only uh, look at those publicly traded companies and brands and so that we can calculate the brand value. Brand contribution, yes, we have um, lots of brands and even private brands, that's fine. However, the financial value we can only get are public company. Uh, so that's why the top 100, and you can see that the, uh, the most, most of them, I would say like 90, 95% of the top brands are public, uh, are public company. Um, but these rules of brand building, for example, meaningful, different salience, those rules also apply for nonprofit organizations, and the only thing is we cannot value them as brand because of lack of uh, financials. Right. Um, and some companies, for example, like Huawei, they are private. Um, they are private company, but they are willing to provide their validated financials. So they're, for example, their KPMG's validated financials, and we are able to uh, value uh, the brand as well. A number of other questions about some of these specific measures. We've talked about brand experience and brand love. You also have innovation, communication. I think there might be some others. Uh, questions of how you measure those and how they combine or how they get weighted together to create the overall brand measure. There, there's some questions there about, you know, is it, is it a simple weighting? Do they always get the same value? Or is there some basis for which those uh, weightings might differ, perhaps, by uh, different types of brands? Um. The categories, yes, we, we actually customize those questions and by, for, for categories, for different categories, uh, specific pur for the specific um, purposes. But the questions we ask uh, overall is the purpose, for example, is which of these brands are trying to make people's lives better and making the, the world a better place. It's basically it's a social responsibility question. And innovation is, um, innovation is an, a summary of is the brand uh, creative is a brand leading the way and also shaking things up because we are seeing that um, many of the fast rising brands they are redefining the category and they are shaking they're shaking things up they are perceived as very high on, on dynamic so that is a, a key character lots of new brands are sharing so that's why this innovation is a summary of um, all these per, all the three perspectives like communication are just a general overall impression of the communication. It's not just advertising. It's the overall communication of the brand. Have you heard of the, any messages of the brand? And uh, what's your overall impression of the communication quality and the content? And, and brand experience, as I mentioned, is meeting needs um, on a scale of 0 to 10 and, uh, and also standing for something unique uh, because the experience is not just um, deliver the functionality, but also needs to stand for something unique, also better mobile experience, better online service, online experience. And the love is, a, is as I mentioned earlier, is an affinity score at 11 points uh, from I hate this brand's neutral and all the way to I love the brand. Yep. And all these are normalized across a relevant country, and so that um, the average score in our database is 100, and then all shown as, as indexes. In those calculations you do, 
are the are you adjusting somehow for different industries, different company sizes, or other factors that are known to affect the uh, the in market returns? Yeah, this needs to be. For example, the, the brand valuation uh, needs to be weighted by, for example, a brand's performance across the country market. Um, their sales contribution by the country market is weighted, certainly needs to be weighted when we come up with their brand, brand value. Right. Yeah, and, uh, but for cross categories, yes, we are doing a lot of weighting and calibration. For example, the overall affinity toward the banking industry, insurance in industry would be way lower than toward like FMCG or fashion, right? So we have to, we needed to uh, calibrate uh, some of these and so that is, is uh, comparable. Certainly a lot of, uh, of questions about the methodology and maybe a few more, so keep, keep them coming. We have a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> What, what can you say about different countries? I know you, you've uh, given us the top 100 brands globally, and you've made a few comments about some of, some of the things you found in different countries. Any other highlights you can provide about how, how different countries' uh, rankings play out, how they might be different from what you see in the overall rating, uh, rankings? Sure. Uh, let me share with you uh, some of the key findings of some uh, of our country ranking. And this, what we just shared with you, are the global top 100 and uh, the drivers behind the global top 100. Um, and for uh, we also every year we also release like China top 100, India top 50 uh, most valuable brands, and Indonesia top 50. And uh, the audience here are highly welcome to come to our website uh, www.brandz.com to download those reports. So a couple of key um, we believe is very important lessons is number one is the fast rise of local brands, and the the local brands are are growing very, very fast in the past five years in these key country markets. And they put a lot of pressure on right now the established global brands like Unilever and P&G and in the performance in these local markets. And because of the fast rise of the local brands and the consumers actually in these country markets, they want to try, uh, they want to uh, they are very open to the local brands, and they, they believe that they, they choose the local brands and also choose a very good value for money. So, right, and if we, you ask the like, Chinese consumers a few years ago, multinational brands definitely took a big advantage. But now, five years later, multinational brands versus local brands, the brand power of local brands have caught up, and this year is even higher on average than multinational brands. So that's a big learning, and I think that's especially uh, important for the audience here is how can we continue to maintain that point of difference, especially in the faster growing markets, as our competition, especially the local competition, is increasing significantly. And second is also related to the local brands is when, those multinational, when the, a few years ago multinational brands are out, are leading the market also because of the investment, media investment, communication investment. However, we see that the local brands' uh, communication, advertising, media investment has caught up. And, uh, and um, in many countries, the local brands have surpassed the multinational brands on media investment. And they become the top uh, advertisers in the market. So their share of voice is basically uh, way higher than the multinational brands. That's put a lot of pressure on our side. And how to, you know, how to uh, make sure that um, we are not playing under the shadow and to, to deliver the brand and product efficiently also to increase, improve our share of voice. That's a, that's a big challenge. Um, so this, would the guidance be that these kind of results would be relevant to smaller businesses as well? Because they, they could be thinking about what these other small businesses that are showing up in the survey have done to achieve that faster growth. So is it relevant to, to small business then too? 
Yeah, we think it's very relevant to a small business. So, for example, like uh, Alibaba and Tencent, they are huge now. But when the first year we valued them, they were still very, very small. And uh, we, we started like the China ranking eight years ago. At that time, we were the first one to identify the growth momentum of Alibaba and Tencent. So we, we give them the, the brand value actually preceded their stock market value. So they're, we see that their brand contribution are very high, and they will have a, a very good uh, growth momentum in the future. So that's where, when we share that with Morgan Stanley and with uh, all the top investment banks. And, uh, and they also uh, believe that the brand power are preceding uh, the market performance. So first, to answer your question, yes, that applies to small brands. And it's especially, uh, apl these lessons are especially applicable to those small and fast rising brands. And you need to make sure that you are very meaningful to your segment consumers. So in the digital era, we cannot start to be relevant to everyone. And we have to start with um, our niche segment and make sure that we are highly relevant and highly impactful, highly impactful for this segment. And examples like Pinterest and examples like many unicorn brands, uh, even Snapchat at, at, uh, a, few, a few years ago, we see that they all started with highly relevant among the, the, the segment and then being perceived very innovative, very dynamic, and shaking things up, and that impact is growing and for the other segments and to become the mass market rising star. Do you, one other uh, kind of difference that people are interested in, are, are you seeing cultural differences? Like when you look across different countries of the world where the cultures may be more collective oriented versus those that may be more individualistic in their, in their cultural outlook. Do you see those kind of differences? Yes, we do see those kind of differences. And for example, um, East is more collective compared to the West and more individualistic. But the trend is also changing. And when the market is developing as to a certain stage, for example, right now we are seeing like China and India, and especially the, the, the affluent group, and they are pursuing individualists the same as uh, we are doing here in New York. So we are seeing that there is more similarity among the city dwellers around the world and compared to the rural um, millennium. So when we talk about uh, global, I think one important trend we have found through the Brenzi um, study is the city young people, they share more similarities than their own country's rural, um, rural uh, youth. So that's, that's quite important for any of the global uh, marketing initiative. For example, Adidas, uh, fast, one of our fast risers, 58% increase. And uh, Adidas, yes, retro is a big trend uh, around the world. But for Adidas, focus on the city youth and, uh, and ret retro uh, communication and uh, back to original, back to the, the, the brand DNA. So that makes the brand particularly su successful. So they, they see the cultural similarities and the geographic similarities uh, rather than uh, the difference and also see the trend for the faster growing brand, uh, fast growing markets where they are heading toward to. You know, um, you mentioned something uh, a little while ago about people could uh, log into your website and learn certain things. I think that would be very interesting to many of our uh, people in the audience. They're, they're, they'd like to go deeper on some of the questions that you've addressed in, the, uh, in this Q&A. So can you go over that again? What is available that people could log in and find out more about? Absolutely. And the, our audience, you are highly welcome to um, go to our website, www.brandz.com, or go to kantarmuerbrown.com, and you will be able to find the Brand Z, all the Brand Z reports and the, the key findings. And also, myself, I'm very, uh, I really like to link, uh, link you on, on LinkedIn and so that we can uh, um, exchange some thoughts. And uh, if you have any questions, very happy to, to, um, to answer those. And here on this screen is my contact, um, and I look forward to connect with you. 
Great. Well, yeah, I think some of the uh, the people, you know, they, they have questions about measurement and methodology and how the data are, uh, how the, the uh, coefficients are estimated for the, the different components of brand. I think those are things that, that are probably uh, things you, you'd want to have a, a deeper conversation about or, or get some more detail on the modeling. But this has been very helpful. Um, I think with that, we'll, uh, we're just about at the top of the hour. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up. If you didn't get questions, as you just heard, Doreen is open to uh, you sending her a note or possibly logging into uh, the website and finding out more about it. So with that, I'd like to, to thank Doreen very much for providing this uh, presentation and answers to the question, questions. And then uh, also just to, to let you know, we have a webinar coming up. Our next one will be on how well do recommendation engines work for your product with Kardec with Sanagar of the University of Pennsylvania. That's on September 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So thanks again, uh, everybody in the MSI audience uh, and for participating in our member-to-member -member webinar series. Thanks to Doreen and uh, look forward to uh, our next session.